All right. Well, welcome in, everyone. You are listening to Bulls Central, and I am joined by none other than our longtime beat writer covering the Bulls for NBC Sports Chicago, as well as the co-host of uh, the Bulls Talk podcast. It is my pleasure to welcome back once again to the show, Casey Johnson of NBC Sports Chicago. Casey, it's great to have you back and appreciate you making the time as always. All right. Good to see you, Jamal. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Sure. Now, I'm sure most of you uh, watching, you're already uh, probably doing this, but if you're not, definitely make sure you're giving KC a follow on Twitter at KCJ Hoop. Uh, check out the great work that they're doing at NBC Sports Chicago and be sure to subscribe to the Bulls Talk podcast. I'll leave a link to that in the description. So, uh, KC, uh, we have reached another end to the Bulls season. It's funny because I think the last time I had you on, you ended the session saying, hey, maybe we can do this again in the second round of the playoffs and talk about the Bulls. Um, how's that for being optimistic? You said, well, we just wrapped up the second round, but of course uh, the Bulls were not on it. And I say it's funny because at the time, you know, the Bulls looked like they were easily going to be a second round team. I think they were second in the East at the time and the Bulls just completely fell off after the All-Star break, falling all the way to the sixth seed. Uh, the Bulls really struggled to really string wins together, not only, uh, you know, that they weren't really able to win games, but they weren't really able to remain competitive in a lot of those um, and so I guess, you know, I had Sam Smith on the other day and I asked him about this as well. And I wanted to get your take because you both have covered the Bulls for so long. And I think as fans, we're trying to rationalize, you know, what sort of happened. Uh, have you ever seen anything like this, you know, seeing such a drastic shift in performance in a single season in your time uh, covering the NBA? No. And I'm curious uh, what Sam said, because he's covered it longer than me. But uh, yeah, I mean, you went from uh, leading the East, which I thought was probably a little bit above their, uh, you know, a pay grade uh, to, as you mentioned, uh, fall into the sixth seed. And it, to me, it was not, as you already mentioned, not the way that they, you know, dropped the sixth seed. It was, I shouldn't say that the fact they dropped the sixth seed was the way they dropped the sixth seed. Those, yeah. those losses were just non-competitive. So I've never really seen such a, a disparity in play. Uh, clearly injuries impacted that situation, but I think now that we've had the benefit of hindsight and we're out of the throes of it, what it revealed more than anything is just how thin that roster was. The back end of the bench, you know, there were some moments early in the season. I'm thinking of that time on the West Coast trip where Derek Jones Jr. was in that backup center, small ball five mm -hmm. role. And, you know, it looked like, okay, this depth is, is legit. But as the season wore on, it just got uh, exposed to me as a, as a huge weakness. I mean, once you went past the Bulls' top seven, maybe eight, um, there was a huge drop off. Uh, and I think the uh, fact that they played such a tough schedule and then had to, you know, feature those guys in, in more prominent roles uh, probably combined to, to shine a light on, on their, their troubles. Thoughts on, you know, I mean, the, the common argument I hear as well, if we only had had Lonzo Ball, we wouldn't have been in this situation, which I don't necessarily agree with because I think Lonzo Ball alone wasn't going to be saving this team from the sudden fall. Um, I did want to ask you actually about Lonzo Ball as well, because I know you wrote about him recently. Um, obviously, he missed a good portion of the season, especially at the end of the year. Like I said, it really impacted the Bulls on both ends of the floor. Um, I think, you know, there were a number of other factors that contributed to the decline in the standings. But you said in the Bulls Talk podcast the other day, you know, Lonzo Ball is a really, really good player. I mean, you're a big fan of Lonzo. Everything he brings on the court, the high basketball IQ for which he plays, I completely agree with. Um, do we need to be concerned? about Lonzo and his long-term health, because you're talking about a guy that's had five seasons in the NBA. He's never really been able to stay healthy in every season that he's been in the league. And um, now we're talking about a second surgery to the same knee that he had to repair after his rookie season, repair after his rookie season. Um, I think as Bulls fans, we're a little worried about that. And, and, you know, in the post uh, exit interviews from our tourists, it sounds like, they don't seem like they're that concerned, but maybe they're just, you know, masking that for the public. Do you think that there is a valid concern for that? Well, whether or not they have it, I mean, it's to me, you just do the math. And, and yeah. I think there should be significant concern, not only from the math of what you mentioned, his history, but uh, the math that, you know, the injury, uh, he was shut down in January and here it is May. And uh, there's still no really definitive answers other than from what I'm told rest and treatment um you know the bone bruise has really bedeviled a lot of people he was due to visit a specialist I've not heard of any need for a follow-up procedure off that visit that's not to say that that what hasn't been discussed I just haven't heard it myself personally so yeah. I'm under the impression that they're still you know just doing rest and treatment for the bone bruise 
Um, you know, training camp is a long way off, so I personally expect them to be healthy by next training camp. That's certainly was Lonzo's publicly stated goal when he talked to us at those exit meetings was just hammering a focus this offseason of figuring out these health issues for long term success. Um, so I expect him to be back and healthy next season, but the injury history is the injury history. And the fact that it's, you know, piling up and well-documented and this one was as pronounced as it was, uh, you know, doesn't really matter what the Bulls think. It's what those of us whose job is to cover the team and obviously fans think uh, is to me just as important. Yeah. And I, I personally you know, there are ser- serious question marks about his ab- ability to stay healthy long term. Well, and he's only 24 years old, too. Right. And it's like uh, it's different when this happens to someone who's in their 30s. But when you're so young and you're continuing to get injured and not being able to stay healthy every year, that becomes a concern. And Bulls fans know it all too well. Right. You know, with Derek Rose and everything like and we, we, we've gone through our share of injuries to very young players. Um, if he were to stay healthy, again, kind of going back to what you were saying uh, in your column, uh, you know, how impactful Lonzo is, if he were to stay healthy, how do you think that sort of makes the bulls going into next season? How does that position them? If they were to keep the core intact, which it sounds like based on what our tourist was saying in his exit interview, continuity is important. Most likely they're probably not going to break up the core. Um, how do, how do you think the bulls can do if Lonzo is actually able to remain healthy? Well, that's obviously assuming that Zach Levine resigns, which I'm sure right. we're going get, to get into. But assuming that happens, um, yeah, I mean, I've, I've said this before, as you know, on, on podcasts, I've written it. I, I personally uh, was astounded at how good he is because he's one of those players that when you watch him, um, you know, maybe twice a year in person and occasionally on league pass, you're like, all right, interesting talent. But the fact that he's completely been able to change his shot to become – an elite shooter, not just a good shooter, an elite shooter. I mean, if you're shooting 42% from three on that high of volume, you're an elite shooter. Um, So his ability to space the floor there. And then just to me, what he does when you watch him on a nightly basis is he, he impacts winning and he transcends the box score. I don't care what his stat line is. I'm a big, I'm a big eye test guy because I am old enough to uh, predate analytics and I'm a big eye (laughs) test guy. If you just watch that dude play, man, he just impacts the game so positively at both ends. Um, his energy, his IQ, his um, kind of infectious uh, enthusiasm. He just makes everybody around him better. His ability to share the ball, his ability to always look ahead, up court, uh, de- defensively, his ability to take any assignment and um, anticipate actions. Um point of attack defense, long arms. I I could go on and on. I mean, I don't care what his stat line is. When I watch him, I'm like, that's a winning basketball player. And um, that's why you can see why uh, management so coveted him and made such a significant and aggressive move to try to acquire him, not only last summer when they were able to, but at the the trade deadline the the season prior. Um, And you can see how important he is to the team. So, Man, if he can stay healthy, I think he's 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 really an important and huge piece to what this current managerial regime's vision is. You mentioned Zach, you know, whether they resign him or not. Let's talk about Zach a little bit. I say a little because I had, you know, like I guess I had Sam Smith, I had Stacey King on recently as well. I want to try to rotate different questions between you guys, but obviously we heard about Zach Levine going to have surgery on that knee that was bothering him at the end of the season. He himself admitted, you know, he's not 100% uh, in the last month of the season or so. He kept mentioning that and he wanted to get it taken care of in the offseason. What's the latest that you can share with us on Zach Levine? When is he expected to get the surgery? If you know, what's the recovery time? I guess, you know, finally, should Zach Levine be another guy that we need to be concerned about in terms of his health, especially if the Bulls are going to offer him a five year max extension? Well, I mean, people always say like, you know, the, uh, the, the minor surgery is the one that's happening to somebody else. Right. So, uh, but that said, from my understanding, this is going to be a pretty routine and minor maintenance type surgery. Um, you know, Zach was very open and transparent about the situation down the stretch of the season. It sounds like it's just going to be a a typical scope and a cleanup, but that said, number one, this is the biggest thing to stress. I'm not a doctor. Uh, (laughs) number two, until they get in there, they won't fully know. Uh, I, I always come back to this. Uh, not only do the bulls take an MRI, but when he visited a specialist, another MRI was done and there's nothing structurally wrong with the knee. So the ACL repair and 
surgery to me, from what I understand is intact. This is just, you know, wear and tear and maintenance that has resulted from probably that original injury and, and, and compensating for that. Um, you know, Zach would talk, sometimes talk about feeling almost like loose cartilage in there. So maybe they just need to go, go in there and clean that up again. I'm not a doctor. I don't know what that means, right. but it, it sounds like this will be your typical run of the mill knee scope, clean it up, get it right. As far as time, I, I don't, I haven't looked at any comps, so I, I wouldn't okay. want to speculate on that, but it sounds like it's also, again, going to be contained within the off season. And, you know, you, you, you probably heard our tourists is, uh, exit interview we asked him point blank i mean will the knee factor into negotiations and his direct quote was no i don't think so he always leaves himself a little wiggle room he's master of that right. but you know i all along have felt like and we can get into the contract stuff or the free agency stuff in a second but i always feel all along i felt like you know the stars have aligned for the bulls to be in a position where they essentially almost have to max sack uh, all the yeah. moves that have they've made leading up to this have, have come to that point so the knee you know, unfortunate that it happened this season and it clearly affected his play down the second half of the season. Um, but it, if you're thinking long term, it sounds like it will be a relatively um, minor and off season contained uh, issue. Yeah, I was actually going to ask you about that. Our tourists exit interview mentioning, hey, it's, you know, when you guys asked point blank is this going to impact the decision and what you guys do with this contract extension? And you said he said, no, do you believe him? Um, here's what I would say to that. Uh, I do believe that the bulls are going to make a serious attempt to resign Zach Levine. Um, I would not be surprised and I'm not, this is totally my speculation. I'm not basing this on any reporting. I would not be surprised if they try to write some injury protection into the contract and how that's received from the other end. I couldn't, um, guess, but I would guess it. You know, at this point, Zach kind of feels like he's earned the right to just be signed outright. Um, the precedent for this is, you know, last this is well documented, but last time when Zach had restricted free agency, the Bulls obviously made him go out and get an offer sheet. And the Bulls were kind of almost spared like the dirty work because the Kings wrote injury protection into the contract that he right. signed for the offer sheet. So then the Bulls had the luxury of just matching that and having that language already in the contract. Um, this time, again, this is just my speculation. I would not be surprised if the Bulls try to proactively, um, you know, include some of that language in, a, in, if they do go decide to go five years. And I don't know the answer to that either. Um, but look, man, you, you, the, the, the number one theme about this is like, you cannot let that guy walk for nothing. I mean, yeah. he's, too, he's too big of an asset on a team that does not have a lot of assets because right. they obviously made aggressive moves that is that has have depleted their asset base so um whether you resign him which i still personally expect to happen um or you know there's some noise about him wanting to go elsewhere and and you work feverishly to try to get on the same page for a sign and trade you have to you cannot let that asset walk for nothing that would be a yeah. crippling move for this franchise you uh you're talking about you know the noise of him wanting to go elsewhere uh, i don't know how accurate some of that noise is but i did want to ask you because you asked him in the exit interview are the bulls the leader in the clubhouse in terms of you know where he wants to go for free agency and uh, he was pretty non-committal in his response which you expect right you you expect them to kind of maintain uh their leverage and making sure that hey i don't want to give away you know who's sort of the top because i want to make sure i'm getting the most money possible but were you surprised by that response at all or do you think that you know I, I kind of look back to even LeBron James in the 2010 free agency. Um, when people asked him, you know, are the Cleveland Cavaliers uh, the leader when you look at your options for free agency? And he said, yeah, they are because they're the team that I currently play for. Um, even though he didn't, right? He went to Miami ultimately. Uh, I kind of expected Zach to say something to that extent saying that, yeah, you know, I mean, I, I love this team and they're, and they're definitely the leader, but I'm still considering other options. Were you surprised by that response at all? Uh, it's a great question. I'll answer it twofold because uh, I, I'll peel back the curtain a little bit. I, maybe I was kind of being uh, naive that day, even for <laughs> a veteran reporter like me, but I'm in your boat. I was kind of expecting Zach to be a little bit more team friendly, good old Zach, Mr. Yeah. Favorable, uh, you know, Bulls. I love the Bulls. And it, actually, if you look back through the comments, there are definitely moments where he does praise the city, the he, franchise. He does. Yeah. 
the organization, the managerial moves, his relationship with Billy Donovan. But those were definitely lost in a bigger picture of, hey, man, this is a business and I'm going to do what's right for me and my family. And I, I'll be honest, I was more like you. I, I was a little surprised by it. But then this is the part peeling back the curtain part. We went into the media room, you know, to work, all of us reporters. And I was like saying what you were saying, like, can you guys believe that? Everyone's like, what are you talking about? He's just, you know, he's just negotiating to get, make sure right. he gets the max. I mean, so yeah. I, I'll admit to being a little naivete there because I just, I know Zach so well. I've been around him for a long time. I've seen his care factor and his commitment to this franchise, but look, he's being smart. Uh, and I always say this, man, unrestricted free agency is such a huge right that players earn. It's like when all those people got mad at Kevin Durant for leaving um, Oklahoma, Oklahoma City, City for, for Golden State. I was like, it's a business. It's like just we, people change jobs all the time. It's like yeah. this is their right to do this. How can you how can you, uh, you know, deny any athlete that right? That's a big deal under restricted free agency. So once I got back to the media room, my colleagues self-corrected me and I realized, oh, yeah, this is a business and it's actually doing the smart thing. So. <laughs> um, one of the things I actually did want to ask you about a topic, I, you know, that I think that hasn't been given as much focus this offseason, because, again, it's primarily dominated around Zach Levine's free agency. But it's in regards to Nikola Vucevic and his contract extension. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, he's extension eligible this offseason, correct? Yeah, yeah, he is. Yep. I've, I've heard you mention before, you know, maybe it's too early in that we would you know, perhaps need to wait until the off season to revisit the Vucevic trade to truly assess whether this was the right move made for the Bulls. So I guess uh, two topics in of itself, what's the latest you're hearing on the possibility of a contract extension for Vucevic this off season. And then maybe, you know, we can kind of revisit the trade and assess now that we have a full season, season and a half behind us and whether that trade actually made sense for the Bulls. Okay. So as far as uh, uh, negotiation, what I would say is uh, all we've done is ask our tourists that publicly. And of course he's going to dance around that. So we did ask him point blank at his exit meeting. And he said, you know, that's something we'll discuss this summer. Just obviously that's going to be his rote response. So for me personally, I've not started to try to report that uh, a big part of reporting to me is timing. So like right now it's mid-May there'd be there. Um, you know, if there is an extension that'll, I wouldn't expect it to be happening now. So at some point I'll start making some calls on that. I personally would be surprised. It's just my own personal opinion. If it, if they reach an extension this summer, unless it's something really short term and team friendly. Right. Um, but uh, cause you know, the other thing about that contract is it, it becomes very valuable next season as an expiring cause expiring sure. contracts have kind of come back in vogue in terms of importance and, and trade value and things like that. So, um, and you still have his rights, you know, through next season. So, I personally would be surprised. That's just my own personal opinion. As far as the trade, that's a, that's a, that's a meaty one. Uh, I did kind of touch on that in a recent edition of, of mailbag at NBC sports, Chicago.com. And I kind of played it down the middle with my answer, because I would just say this, like, I'm just so used to covering a regime um, with two regimes, really. Cause I covered a, a d decent portion of Jerry Krause's uh, regime that, that just did not trade first round draft picks. They just valued right. them like gold. So for me to now be getting to know a no, new regime on a personal and professional basis, and then see them so aggressively trade away first round draft picks, it's been a mental uh, calculus adjustment for me personally. Um, you know, I understand why they did it uh, because their attempt to restore relevancy in short order was very important to them. And they saw opportunities to get, two all-star players in, in Vucevic and DeRozan. Um, I, I, I did say this in the mail, like I get less hung up on like, oh, look at what Wendell Carter Jr. is doing in Orlando. In my personal opinion, Jamal, he was done here mentally. Yeah. I'm not saying he wouldn't have been a competent player here. I don't think he'd reach, I would have, I don't think he would have reached his ceiling here because I think he was just too worn out mentally with kind of the, the difficult start he had here. So I think he needed to go Great. somewhere else to kind of get and then as far as Wagner I mean great player but you, there's no guarantee the Bulls would have drafted him so you can't say okay look at what Wagner's doing maybe they would have drafted him I don't know yeah. so I get less hung up on that and just more focus on the first round picks I'm just not used to covering a regime that trades away uh, and so I will say the two first round picks for Vucevic does give me a little bit of pause because that's yeah. that's a that's a pretty high price to pay um for a guy that uh, you know, is definitely still an important piece, but looks like he might be starting the tail off portion of his career. Um, and that's just, that, that's a lot. So again, I'm 
playing it down the middle. Uh, I understand why they did it, and I think Vucevic is a very good player. Uh, I probably support him more than many in the fan base uh, do, um, or defend him, I should say. But uh, yeah, that's that's one. Uh, I'll probably wait another couple of years <laughs> to fully answer that. Yeah. But those, you know, next year when they're owing uh, Orlando another first round pick, man, that's that's at a time you'll see what they've done this 22, 23 season. That's going to be, that's going to be hard to, to well, watch. Let's hope that it's more of a late first rounder than a lottery pick this time. Um, but I, I, I agree. And I think it would have been different had Vucevic performed to the level that we sort of anticipated that he would be at that all-star level that he was playing at in Orlando. I mean, we can, we can obviously go into the mechanics of Vucevic's season. I mean, he's had inconsistent season, but maybe wasn't utilized properly uh, throughout the year obviously it's a big role shift for him from being a number one option in Orlando to now really the third option with the Bulls so I get it and uh, um, my my really thinking around that trade is do the Bulls get DeMar DeRozan if they don't make that trade and I think that question has probably been asked a lot I'm sure you've heard that as well do, do you think that the Bulls would have been able to get someone like DeMar DeRozan or even Lonzo Ball for that matter because really by getting Vucevic that signaled to other free agents Hey, we mean business. We want to start winning now. Or do you think that that's kind of not really that much of a factor in, in the decision making of some of these other guys? I I think um, I think it plays a small part. But it, if you're, I, I don't want to answer bro- too broadly here because I'll I'll specifically talk about DeRozan. DeRozan would have come here because look at the salary. I mean, no no other team was giving him sure. that salary. So look, he's he too has been incredibly open with his dalliance with the Lakers and fully expected to sign there. When that did not happen and the Lakers pivoted to acquiring Russell Westbrook, the Bulls just blew everybody else out of the water with that money. Yeah. So, I mean, the fact that, you know, and both Vucevic and DeRozan have been open about this. They, they've they jokingly talked about, oh, it would be awesome to play together one year. And they're clearly good friends from their one year together at USC. So that didn't hurt the matter. But DeMar, from my perspective, was coming here regardless, just off that contract. <laughs> that contract was a, a, a healthy one. So, um you know, as far as Lonzo, I also think just the way that management uh, aggressively pursued him to the point that they got docked a second round pick for tampering. And, you know, it was clearly they were enamored with him at the trade deadline, as I mentioned before, uh, the prior season. And, um, you know, I, I think also he probably would have come here, too. But be, beyond their two specific examples, I do think getting back to the Vucevic trade that did I will to kind of separate these. I think that signaled to the league how serious this management team is about winning and what kind of how aggressive they would be to achieve what they want in a roster because I think they just kind of came in in evaluation mode and then they're like this roster just is soft and they don't yeah. like softness you know so yeah. they just started trading guys away um, so I think it was important to the league and that when when the trade was made but as far as the two specific uh free agency examples uh and he, i would even say with for caruso too because once the lakers decide not to match that's a great contract for caruso i think all three of those guys would have come here anyway okay. um but i i do think that the vuce trade was still important for league perception for sure right right i did want to shift gears a little and talk about billy donovan for a second because there were you know some bulls fans that felt a lot of the blame uh for the bulls poor end of season play sits with donovan now whether that's Fair or not, you know, we can talk about, but I saw a lot of fans calling out Billy on social media and him needing to be held more accountable for the Bulls slump. And I think, you know, part of it goes back to trying to rationalize and figure out what happened with this team in the final weeks of the season, you know, trying to figure out who do we blame. But going into next season, how important will this be for Billy Donovan and his future with the Bulls? If the Bulls start coming out flat yet again to start the season, do you think Billy will be on the hot seat? Or do you think because this front office, they really, really doubled down with how aggressive they were in hiring Billy Donovan, that his job probably is more safe than people think. I mean, I can just tell you, I mean, these are like two, two, a two prong question. We you started with like performance, which I, we can talk about later. I can just tell you that from my seat, the relationship between Billy Donovan and management is about as tight as can be. I mean, right. they, the, 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 that partnership that they always talk about is genuine, legit and strong. And I, I mean, Billy signed a long-term big money deal. I don't, I don't see Billy Donovan going anywhere in the near future. Uh, and in fact, Paul Sullivan, my former colleague at the Tribune, who was loosely around the beat this year, asked Billy about a contract extension at his exit media interview, which 
I, I was joking with silly. That kind of caught me off guard because I wasn't, I mean, he's got two years left, you know, it's right. like, I wasn't expecting that question. Uh, it was a good question, but uh, I, I don't think, you know, I'm not thinking extension right now, but I, I, him getting him being on a hot seat isn't even on my radar as far as a view. Sure. Well, what about the performance though? But do you think that there should be some sort of blame or level of accountability for his, for not just him, him but the coaching staff in general? Uh, you know, I always say this, like, I think, uh, I think like the fans ability to critique coaches is their right. But like, I don't know, you don't, you don't know what's conveyed behind closed doors. You don't know right. get what game plans are dispelled. Um, you just, you know, watch the games. Now you can start, you can certainly quibble some things. I mean, one thing I get consistently and you touched on this earlier is usage of Vucevic, you know, um, it's clear he was going to be in a different role in terms of offensive option because he went from number one to number three option, but I got consistently the need for him to be down on the block more. And I, you know, I, some, some people that I talked to are on the league uh, scouts and things like that would probably agree with that. You know, I mean, they think that he was on the perimeter a little too much. So right. <laughs> um, you can certainly quibble something like that, but look, Billy, you know, people always say like Billy doesn't make adjustments. Billy made a ton of adjustments in that buck series. I thought uh, yeah. they changed their pick and roll coverage. They um, changed their rotation. Um, so, you know, I don't know. I just can tell you that Billy, to me, his teams are prepared to me, he uh, has the respect of his players, um, and he's certainly a good face of the franchise. I mean, he's very comedying with the media, uh, yeah. you know, talks to us multiple times. So, I don't know. I, 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 I've never been one comfortable co critiquing coaches because I, they know a heck of a lot more about basketball than right. me. Um, I, I, I don't think he's in any danger at all. And I, you know, I remind fans about that a lot, that uh, it is important that he has the respect of the players, um, because I feel that the last couple of coaches that we probably had, maybe even back to Tom Thibodeau, it's not that they didn't respect Tibbs or Hoiberg or Jim Boylan. It's just that there didn't appear to be that close bond and relationship. And there seemed to be frustrations and friction sometimes, at least, you know, just based on what was communicated to the to the media anyway. And I think people don't really value that meaning fans you know when they just see like oh billy donovan why you know why is he doing this why is he doing that it's important that he has the respect of the players um and and having the trust of that locker room so i, I think that's a valid point two things i would say real quick uh uh his communication and his consistency are huge and that those mm -hmm. are really big aspects in today's nba and then i would push back a little bit on your contention of thibodeau because uh players certainly respected him that he drove them crazy sometimes but right certainly respected him and if, as you've seen people as these players move on through their careers you know once you get removed from tom and see the methods of, of his madness uh the, the the praise flows backwards a lot too you know yeah so. i think uh, there was a noah said this once right where it was like if we weren't winning and doing so well, I would just hate you so much, but because we're winning, I don't really care. And Tom uh, said, I, I, I feel the same about you. So. <laughs> those, um, two, those two are two peas in a pod. Man. Oh yeah, for oh, sure. Man. For sure. Uh, the other, the last guy that I wanted to talk about um, just for a little bit uh, is, you know, probably one of the more polarizing players among Bulls fans. And I believe is one of the bigger question marks in terms of whether he'll be with the Bulls next season. And that's Kobe White. Uh, you mentioned in your column around, you know, which players are going to be staying with the team and which are going to be going. Uh, Kobe White is one of those players that could get moved for the right opportunity, uh, as I believe you said. You know, what do you think the chances of Kobe remaining on the roster going into next season are? If he is ultimately moved, who do you think his trade value or what do you think his trade value even is right now? And what could we get in return for him? Yeah, I don't think it's that high um, because, you know, he's had uh, just so many uh, inconsistent roles. Um, this is a little bit out of his control. This is where I empathize a little bit with Kobe. I mean, he's, you know, had so many roles in terms of starting, coming off the bench, playing on the ball, playing off the ball. So I'm not sure the league really knows exactly what he is or what his ceiling can be. There's always one team that can maybe see, you know, beauty in the eye of the beholder and can say, oh, wow, that's somebody we got to have. Um, so I, I don't think his value is that high. I can see, you know, I can see an opportunity for him in an expiring uh, getting moved for some piece that fits the Bulls, or maybe this is total speculation, but maybe 
maybe him and the draft pick to move up if there's somebody in the draft that they that they really really like and, and I haven't even started digging in on the draft so I don't I don't know that um so those are just speculative possibilities or ideas that I personally have cooked up in my own head you know Kobe I would agree with you is polarizing and, and he's a tough one to read because he also is extension eligible and we asked our tourists about that and our tourists did not answer it or answered it without answering it, which is right. great. And most executives uh, route. Uh, but what I would say is um, if you look on paper, he still feels like a huge need because the bulls need tons of shooting. They are so mm-hmm. poor and uh, non deep in shooting. And, you know, as we all have seen, Kobe has the ability to get hot in a hurry and has put up big shooting games. Um, so he fills a direct need, and he's still on a rookie deal. I I think the only thing I would feel comfortable f- strongly predicting is I do not see the two sides reaching uh, common ground on, a, on an extension of his rookie deal this summer, which means he'd be entering restricted free agency next summer. Um, that's probably the only strong prediction I would feel comfortable making about his future. I, I just am doing the math. Um, you know, the Bulls – if Zach comes back, have four guards they've committed a lot of money to. And he's kind of, well, I should say um, three guards. And then Io to me seems right. like he's a strong piece of their future. They haven't committed big money to him, but you know, when you get him in the second round, he looks like he's a, a focal point moving forward. So um, it's just, it's just to me like almost it, it's both ways. He fills a need on one hand, but he also could be a luxury on the other. So that's why I see him being, you know, certainly potentially uh, it, movable in trade talks. Yeah, I mean, it would be different, right, if Io didn't uh, progress in the way that he did in his rookie season, um, because I think that sort of let a lot of people know that, hey, this guy is probably a more important piece for this franchise going forward, and the backcourt's just really loaded right now. Uh, and so that's, I think, the biggest question on my mind is, where does Kobe kind of fit, right? Because you really kind of have to choose between Kobe and Io, and it seems like they're probably going to go with Io, especially since that was their draft pick while Kobe was a pick from the old regime. Um, Casey, I'll get you out of here on this one. Uh, predictions for the offseason. What do you think will be the most surprising move? Maybe we're not anticipating, like kind of like we saw last season when Arturis and Mark went after uh, DeMar DeRozan. Or do you think there will be any surprising moves? Maybe it's going to be kind of, you know, status quo. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm drinking the Kool-Aid on this one. I, I think, you know, assuming that Zach resigns, um, I guess, you know, if you, if you're asking for a, a surprising prediction, I don't even know if I fully believe this, but the, you know, I think Zach being elsewhere is certainly a possibility, but assuming the bulls are able to retain him, I'm drinking the Kool-Aid. I think they, I think they're legit about wanting to see this group grow together and continuity. Now here's why. Because you heard it not only in these exit meeting interviews, you heard it at the, at the trade deadline when they, yeah. when they expected yeah. everybody to be back fully healthy. And we want to see what this group can do when fully healthy because in the limited sample size we've seen, it's been pretty legit. I mean, that was, you saw, that was a fun, you know, two-way team, um, mm-hmm. uh, you know. They were. Fully yeah. healthy. So I – I don't see a lot of surprises. I I certainly see them addressing roster depth, um, you know, with, with salary cap exceptions or trades or, or what have you, but I don't see any big surprises assuming Levine is back. Yeah. Well, Casey, as always really appreciate you taking the time out of your day to come on. It does mean a great deal to me Uh, and my audience. We always love hearing from bulls insiders. Uh, Keep up the great work, both on the writing front, as well as on the bulls talk podcast Enjoy the off season. I uh, hope you get some time off and uh, looking forward to your guys' coverage as we go into next season. Thanks for having me, Jamal. I appreciate it.